Hello everyone. Today, we're going to take a look at both inch and metric dial calipers, proper technique for using them, as well as some care and maintenance tips. I have timestamps for each section down in the description in case you're looking for something specific. I'd also like to thank KBC Tools for helping to make this video. They really like the educational content that I've been creating here on YouTube and they wanted to help support that, so they've generously provided all of the tools that I'm showing in this video. I have a link to both their website and their Instagram page down in the description. Let's look at all the parts of a pair of calipers. We have the beam and the dial that show our measurements. There's a lock screw on top of the sliding jaw so you can hold the jaws in position. This screw down here is a lock for the bezel of the dial in case you need to adjust it. This thumb wheel is here so you can open and close the jaws quickly. Then we have the various measuring surfaces of the tool, which I will talk about in depth in just a few moments. First, let's talk about how to read dial calipers, starting with the graduations on the beam and the dial. On the metric variety, the beam is graduated in millimeters with larger graduations every 10 millimeters that are numbered accordingly. The dial on this type is marked in 0.05 millimeter increments, with each trip around the dial being 5 millimeters. As you can see, the dial is numbered every 0.5 millimeters, and there are larger numbers at each millimeter of travel, marking 0 to 4 on the outside and 5 to 9 on the inside. Some varieties are graduated in 0.02 millimeter increments with 2 millimeters of travel around the dial. The principles are exactly the same, you just need to be aware of what you have. Let's look at some sample measurements. On this piece, we have 25 millimeters showing on the beam and another 0.4 and some change showing on the dial, almost 0.45, which makes sense because this is one inch diameter stock, which is 25.4 millimeters, and then there's some tolerance on the size. If we look at the size of this small counter bore here, we can see we have 20 millimeters showing on the beam and another 0.4 millimeters on the dial for a total of 20.4 millimeters. For the inch calipers, the beam is marked every 100 thousandths of an inch, and every inch has a larger graduation and number. The dial is graduated in thousandths of an inch, and one full revolution of the needle equals the 100 thousandths that we see on the beam. The dial also has larger graduations for every 5 thousandths of an inch and every 10 thousandths of an inch is numbered to help with the reading. On both types, the edge of the sliding jaw shows where you are on the beam scale and of course the needle points to your reading on the dial. Let's look at some samples of inch caliper readings. We can see on the beam we have 700 thousandths of an inch showing, 0.700. And on the dial, another 46 thousandths, 0 0.046, for a total of 746 thousandths. If we wanted to check the diameter at the bottom of this thread relief, we can squeeze that in with the tapered ends of the jaws. And we're showing 900 thousandths on the beam, and another 2 thousandths on the dial, for a total of 902 thousandths of an inch. From here on out, everything applies to both inch and metric dial calipers. There are actually four different ways of measuring with calipers, and this part actually applies to dial, digital, and vernier calipers. You can measure outside diameters or features with the main jaws right here. The small jaws up on top are used for measuring internal features, although you should be aware that this is not particularly accurate for measuring holes smaller in diameter than about 1 inch or 25 millimeters. Your measurements will come out smaller than they actually are because the jaws have a little bit of a flat on the edges. These will contact the diameter of the hole across a chord of a circle like this. This issue is much more pronounced the smaller the diameter of the hole is. It's good enough to get an idea of the size of the hole, but if you need an accurate measurement to hit a tight tolerance, it's really best to use a different measuring tool, like telescoping gauges, bore gauges, or gauge pins. Moving on, we have the depth rod at the end of the calipers. 
This is used for getting depth measurements on holes and other features. It can also be used to measure the lengths of steps like this one, but it's not particularly stable in this orientation because it doesn't have much of a footprint at all on the part. It's free to tip in all directions, which will definitely affect your measurement. The depth rod is just better suited to situations where the end of the calipers can be supported by the part. The best option for a feature like this one is to use the step measurement on the ends of the jaws. This is the least apparent method of using calipers, but it is incredibly handy. The ends of both the stationary and moving jaws are ground together, so you can use them to measure steps like this very easily. This is also a lot more stable because you have much more contact between the tool and the part, and the calipers can't tip side to side as easily. You can certainly still have issues with tilting front to back in this direction where the tool is the thinnest, and that can certainly affect your measurement. But with a bit of practice, you'll learn to feel when the tool is stable. Speaking of proper technique, let's address some good practices to follow when you're measuring with calipers. First of all, I pointed out this thumb wheel at the beginning of the video, and that's what I call the wheel of inaccuracy. This is here to help you open and close the calipers quickly, but I often see people using it to actually measure parts. For quick and dirty work, that's probably fine, especially if you have a highly developed sense of feel. But you have a whole lot of leverage on the jaws when you use the wheel. Seriously, you can squeeze the heck out of it and make your measurement quite a bit smaller than the actual measurement of the part. The most reliable way of measuring with the outside jaws is to squeeze the jaws themselves. This lets you feel when the jaws are seated well against the part, and you won't be able to put an excessive amount of force on the tool that might affect your measurement. Likewise, when you're measuring with the inside jaws, you need to slightly rotate the jaw within the part to find the spot where the jaws settle into the measurement. This is a bit easier on an inside diameter because the jaws will eventually find the high spots across the diameter of the circle, and it'll be difficult to hold the jaws at an angle to the part. However, when you're measuring something like a slot or a keyway, it's quite easy to hold the calipers at an angle to the feature. This results in a larger measurement than what you actually have. In these situations, you need to rotate the jaws within the part like before, but now you're looking for the point where the calipers read the smallest measurement. Measuring with the depth rod takes a certain finesse, as I mentioned before. I find I get the best results by extending the depth rod out farther than I need it, and then bringing the rest of the calipers to the part. Trying to do it the other way around tends to lift the calipers up off the part like a jack, and it's difficult to get consistent readings. The same thing goes for making a step measurement. Get the end of the calipers in position first, and then slide the moving jaw up to meet it. You can rock the calipers around to feel when the jaws are seated on the part, and it's a good idea to take multiple measurements to make sure you're getting consistent readings each time. Trust me, if you're getting wildly different readings, the problem is with you, not the tool. A little bit of practice will help you develop a feel for how the tool behaves and will lead to better results. Now let's talk about some strengths and weaknesses of dial calipers. The great strength of calipers is their simple use. They're easy to read, versatile, and moving between large and small measurements is trivial. They're also available in a wide range of measurements, although this is a bit of a mixed blessing, and that brings us to their greatest weaknesses. That wide range introduces the very real possibility that a small error in measurement will stack up along the length of the tool. There's actually quite a bit of clockwork inside the guts of these things, and each of those little mechanical components might have tiny inaccuracies in their dimensions that will directly translate to the accuracy of the reading. Perhaps that error is negligible over a short distance, but as the gears turn against each other repeatedly, the inaccuracy adds to itself over and over again to be quite significant, especially in the larger sizes of calipers. This is the reason why micrometers only have a travel of 1 inch or 25 millimeters, regardless of their frame size. Overall, calipers are not as accurate as micrometers and really should not be relied upon for tight tolerance work. 
All the gearing hiding under the hood is very prone to damage if the calipers are dropped. As you can imagine, all the delicate mechanisms within have a tendency to just go sproying all over the place with even a small impact, especially the spring that eliminates the backlash from all the gears. If that comes loose, you'll notice the needle does not return to the same place each time the tool is opened or closed. You can see this on this old beat up pair of calipers that's not been taken care of. Obviously, these calipers can no longer be trusted to make accurate measurements and will need either repair or replacement. The same thing can actually happen to dial indicators as well. You can also run into problems if dirt and grit find their way into the works. This is particularly troublesome with the rack and pinion that sets all the clockwork in motion. The rack is exposed when the calipers are open and only minimally shielded by the depth rod when they're closed. So it's actually pretty easy to get a chip or some grinding grit in there. Beyond making the tool feel like it's full of sand, it can cause the pinion to skip a tooth on the rack, which will make the needle land in the wrong spot on the dial. This brings us to the care and maintenance part of the video. Most importantly, whenever you're using calipers at a machine, you should always take care to keep them where they're not going to be sprayed by all of your machining detritus, especially if you're sanding or grinding. Keeping them clean will help maintain their accuracy for as long as possible. In all likelihood though, you will eventually notice that your calipers don't read zero when fully closed. In fact, it's good practice to check this every single time you use them, because it can happen for a variety of reasons. Some innocuous and easy to remedy, others not so much. The very first thing you should check is whether the jaws are clean. It's pretty common to get a small chip stuck to the jaws, especially when handling oily parts. This is easily solved by wiping them off and closing the jaws again to check if that was the issue. I'm in the habit of wiping off the jaws every time I pick up any of my calipers, no matter which type I'm using, dial, digital, or vernier. If the dial still doesn't read zero, you can adjust the dial itself. The bezel has a clamp to hold it in place, and loosening this thumb screw allows you to turn it so that zero on the dial lines up with the needle. The needle really should be pointing at about the 12 o'clock position on the dial. If it's way off, that's an indication that the clockwork guts of the tool have gotten out of time. The most likely culprit is a chip or other debris that's gotten into the rack and pinion mechanism, causing the gear to skip a tooth. That brings us back to the whole keep them clean thing. Open the jaws up to the widest extreme and check to see if there's anything in the rack and clean it out if there is. Calipers usually ship with a tool that's used to fix this problem. It's a small shim that can be inserted into a slot behind the bezel clamp, allowing you to move the jaw with the gearing disengaged. Doing this requires a little bit of trial and error to get the needle back in the right spot, but it's a relatively painless process. Honestly, the hardest part of it is finding this tool when you need it, since it's pretty easily lost. I'm sure there's a fair amount of people out there who don't realize what it's for and just toss it. You often see people setting a measurement and then using the calipers to scribe a line on a part, either by hand or while it's running in the lathe. Obviously, this is going to cause some wear on the tips of the jaws. My metric calipers actually have carbide jaws, so theoretically they'll last longer, but carbide has a tendency to chip, so that may just be trading one type of damage for another. If you're going to do this, use a cheap pair of beater calipers for it, so you're not abusing a perfectly good measuring tool. To sum it all up, don't drop them, keep them clean, check them often, and don't use them for tight tolerance work. I'm writing a very similar video right now covering vernier calipers. That should be out sometime within the next decade, so stay tuned. Thanks again to KBC Tools for helping make this video. They really are a great company to work with, and they have a fantastic selection of everything you might need for your shop. Check out their links down in the description. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to see me cover in a future video, leave those down in the comments section below. While you're down there, hit that like and subscribe button if you think I've earned it, and please consider supporting the channel over on Patreon like the fantastic people you see on your screen right now. You might also want to check out these other videos. On the right, I have a playlist of all of my other videos on measuring tools. 
On the upper left, I have my most recent video, and on the lower left, there's a video that YouTube thinks you'll like just as much as this one. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time.